everyone. I'm uh, just going to tell you a few of the little, I'm not Bono. Uh, just in case there was anybody confused there. Although I, I'm here as his friend to explain what's going to happen tonight. I have a lot of experience in appearing on behalf of other people. When I was a young fellow, my uncle was the president of the United States, Jack Kennedy. And when I was a little kid, I would go everywhere and they would say, oh, he's appearing, his uncle's the president of the United States. Then my father got rather famous. He started the Peace Corps. And then I went, when I was a little older places, and I would speak on behalf of my father, Sarge Shriver, founded the Peace Corps. Then my mother got famous. She started the Special Olympics. And I would go places and speak here with my mother, Special Olympics. Then, if you're in a big Irish family, the worst thing is one of you becomes very famous. And that happened to my sister, Maria, became a noted television person, so occasionally I would have to go and fill in for her. So then I was Maria Shriver's brother. It's very embarrassing, but then the really horrible thing happened, which is that Maria got married, and I had to go places as Arnold Schwarzenegger's brother-in-law. So uh, the Republic, are there any Republicans here? Any Democrats? Okay. Okay, here's what's going to happen. The number one most important thing is that when the choir, who are called the Gateway Ambassadors, who have come all the way from Ghana here, who are between 14 and 17 years old, they're going to come out and start playing these drums. When they come out, I want to hear like a really big cheer. They have come to America for this. They are young people who are going to sing you some African stuff and some American stuff that they've just learned. And we want to hear a loud cheer. So, we're going to practice. Okay? Or maybe I should just say, where are the Democrats? <laughs> we had a lot of fun because we arrived here the night of the football game and none of us had ever heard anything like that. So, although that was good, let's try one more time. They come all the way from Africa. What are they going to hear? That was good. Second thing is that on, um, at a certain point, there's going to be a Q&A. And for that, if you want to ask a question, you raise your hand. And the ushers, who are standing in various places, uh, will come over and give you a piece of paper and a little pencil. Very important to write your question clearly, or we won't be able to read it. And then they will pass all, the ushers will pass all those things to David Gartner, who's standing down here, is the, in fact, why don't I have all the people who, there, we have our organization, it's called DATA, which stands for Debt, AIDS, Trade in Africa, in return for democracy, accountability, and transparency. And the people who are working for that, are, maybe I could ask them to stand up so even after the event, if you have questions or you'd like to work with us or help us, you would know what they look like. And I think some of them are standing down here. So will the DATA people who are here stand up? Here they are. These people are working very hard. Okay, that's it. They're going to come out in about four or five minutes. Any questions on what's going to happen? Cheer is important. Okay, we'll be right back.
these two women who are here, Marquita and Grandma, are the organizers of this gang. And uh, they're going to introduce the rest of them in a second. But I just wanted you to see the two of them and, and to know that after the events, again, just like the data staff will be hanging around, they'll be hanging around and be pleased to have you meet uh, the uh, young people and to uh, tell you their stories, OK? So now the formal beginning we're handing to Grandma. Good evening. And as he says, I am Grandma. <laughs> I'm pleased to introduce to you and present to you the Gateway Ambassadors.
Wow, yeah. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much to the Gateway Ambassadors from Ghana. And welcome to this very special E.N. Thompson Forum on World Issues. My name is Art Thompson. I'm president of the Cooper Foundation. We've co-sponsored the forum with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln for 15 years to increase our understanding of the international issues and challenges that face us all. We hope today's lecture inspires each of us to reach out to those who are facing a health crisis in Africa and to bring understanding and awareness to their plight. Over the years, the forum has exposed Nebraskans to critical thinkers and world leaders who are shaping our global society. We've heard from leaders such as form, for, former Russian President Mikhail Gorbachev, Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, and Holocaust survivor and peace activist Elie Wiesel. Please be sure to attend our next forum lecture, which will feature Dr. Ahmad Chalabi on Thursday, March 6, 2003. For more information on the forum, you can check our website at unl.edu or cooperfoundation.org. Local partners for today's forum are the Lead Center for Performing Arts, the Chancellor's Office, the University of Nebraska Foundation, the UNL Office of Communications, Nebraska Educational Telecommunications, St. Paul United Methodist Church, and radio stations KRNU, KLIN, and KFOR. Today's forum is also being co-sponsored by the UNL University Program Council and the local organization <coughs> Save Sub-Saharan Orphans, led by Nelson Maruka. At the conclusion of this... leading it, isn't he? <laughs> At the conclusion of this evening's lecture, we will facilitate a question and answer session for our evening's speakers. Now, please welcome to the podium Harvey Perlman, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Harvey. Thanks, Art. A university's mission is to serve as a forum for thoughtful commentary and impassioned rhetoric. It is a place where students grow, formulate their basic values, and are inspired to act upon them. Most importantly, this university is committed to expanding our students' horizons, to make them conscious and concerned about their global community. The Ann Thompson Forum provides the University of Nebraska-Lincoln the opportunity to present these ideas and explore issues that inform today's world. We are grateful to the founders of the series, Jack Thompson and the Cooper Foundation, for their leadership as a partner in this series. Today's speakers promise to fulfill the university's mission, bringing us information about one of the most destructive forces in the world today, HIV and AIDS, particularly as they relate to Africa. The University of Nebraska-Lincoln might seem to be a universe away from Africa, yet research underway on this campus may help find a cure for the virus. A $10.7 million grant from the National Institutes of Health helped this university establish the Nebraska Center for Virology with partners at UNL, UNMC, and Creighton University. Under the direction of Dr. Charles Woods and his colleagues are working hard to design an HIV vaccine and are partnering with the University Teaching Hospital in Zambia to train scientists and advise clinicians in Zambia. Like these researchers, today's speakers use their talents to bring awareness to a crisis that threatens to overwhelm our world. Let me welcome Bono, debt relief campaigner and activist who has managed to persuade both sides of the aisles in Congress to listen to this need. Ashley Judd, an actress who wants to use her celebrity status to remove the stigma and raise awareness of the crisis. Lance Armstrong, world-renowned cyclist who, like Ashley, wants to use his celebrity status and inspiring personal story. Dr. Eric Goosby, who brings years of clinical and field experience about how to beat AIDS, and above all, Agnes, who has flown from Uganda and left Africa for the first time to join us, whose story represents the real reason why we're all here today. Please.
please welcome Ashley Judd to the podium. Good evening. They're trainable. <laughs> I'm new at this, and at church, when I've ever read scripture or something like that, you say good morning and the congregation responds. So I thought if we did something like that, it might help put me at ease. Let's try that again. <laughs> good evening. We are so amazingly delighted to be here and are extremely um, pleased with such a great turnout. I know we have a real mixture in this audience of people who are familiar with HIV and who, in fact, are activists at a grassroot level and people who are, um, and I don't mean this unkindly, completely ignorant of the facts. So it's a wonderful uh, brew and hopefully we'll all learn something tonight. I fully expect from our incredible forum up here as well as the questions the audience will pose to learn a bunch of stuff myself. So thank you Chancellor and the University for having us. We're very esteemed. And um, as I alluded to, you're in for a really interesting program. We've got I, I, I was thinking earlier when I was lying down, everyone on this stage represents the apex of some kind of experience or interaction with HIV. You have my husband and I who really don't know that much and are, are just beginning this odyssey of learning. You've got Bono, who's this tireless crusader and, and, and debt relief worker, Bobby Shriver, whom you met, who is his fantastic cohort, Agnes, who is whose life is personally ravaged by this disease in, in a way that is like seemingly unbearable and yet she bears it and tells the story with such exquisite dignity. You know, you've got Lance who, who suffered himself um, a life-threatening illness and rallied from that not only to live a full life but a life full of extraordinary accomplishment. And then Dr. Goosby who is, is an extraordinary scientist and really at the forefront of, of AIDS research. So we're going to hopefully um, entertain you a little bit, alarm you a lot, and then educate and inspire you. So one of the things that I was kind of pondering when I was, when I was thinking about taking this on was um, sometimes people don't want people like me to open their mouths out of uh, our proper forum. You know, you want to hear Bono sing with you too. You hopefully want to hear Winona sing. You want to see Lance Pedal, Dario Drive, and me do my movies, and then basically shut up so you can go home and watch America's Funniest Home Videos or do whatever it is that you want to do with your free time. And you don't want us to preach to you or, or say, hey, this is important to me. And it can be a fine line to navigate. But when I got hip to some of these facts, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to keep my mouth shut. This isn't something that I'm just going to read like everyone else and dismiss. I'm going to bear it. And I'm going to bear it to the rest of the world to the best of my ability so that we can inspire hope and change and show that America is a country not only of prosperity but of mercy. So I'm going to hopefully um, stun you a little bit with some of these facts that I was exposed to. And the, the, you know, the, the thing is to personalize it, not have it just seem like a whole bunch of numbers that are kind of distant. So if I tell you that um, 6,500 men, women, and children die every single day in Africa, that's not just today, that's tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. And it doesn't take a break for Christmas. It's a relentless thing. And that number equals the graduating class of this year's University of Nebraska class. So think about that contrast. You've got these kids who have been beautifully educated here, who are graduating to face the world full of enthusiasm and spirit, and then you've got men, women, and children who are just like waking up to die. So in addition to that, we've got um, a pretty numbing statistic, which is that 9,500 additional people contract the disease on a daily basis. So, you know, that's, that sucks. And um, that's a lot of people. And you've got mothers who will give birth to a child that they have infected in utero. And it's about, I think 15%, is it Dr. Hughesby, the infection rate? But if the mother does not transfer the HIV virus to her child in utero, if she breastfeeds, she's guaranteed to infect her child. And when I was thinking about that earlier, 
I mean, it's just, it's so stunning because you've got breast milk, which is this phenomenally, divinely designed substance which nourishes and encourages life. It's full of antibodies and this, you know, like plenty for a little baby, but in an HIV infected person, it's a death serum. And then there's the situation with women, which obviously I'm going to relate to. I think that we all have a propensity to identify with our own peer group. And it, it's, it's, it's pretty bad for young women. The infection rate for 15 to 24-year-old girls is, is twice that of boys because they're in a situation where they can't really stick up for themselves in terms of requesting, demanding, you know, saying, hey, you're not going to get it unless we have some sort of protection here and they're economically and socially dependent on men and, and they're really in a pickle. So if that doesn't get you, then you've got this, this idea of um, the orphans. There are in Malawi 300,000 orphans whose, you know, obviously parents have been um, killed by AIDS and then in Ethiopia there are a million orphans. So imagine Nebraska, you know, every child in the state of Nebraska is an HIV orphan and what that would do to your social structure, to your stability, to your crime rates, to everything. I mean, you've got these kids destitute and desperate and absolutely hopeless. I think that's a lot of chaos and, and frenzy. So after all of that, um, which is the sad part and the overwhelming part, the good news is that um, that mother could have gotten a $4 shot to prevent herself from infecting her child with the HIV virus. and. There is so much that can be done. And hopefully when you leave here tonight, to borrow an expression from Jamie, who's this tireless, inspired, behind the scenes worker, you should be punching the air with like this sense of, oh my God, I can leave this room and change the world. I truly can make a difference. I can fill out the form that was provided to me. I can tell my friends about it. I can, you know, call that number with the secretary, the cute lady at the White House who answers the phone and leave a message for the president because I think that in some way we all want to change the world. We want to, um, as the poem says, oh crap, I say it every night to myself. Can I say it when I put myself on the spot? Um, uh, lives of good men all remind us we can make our lives sublime, thus departing, leave behind footprints on the sands of time. And then our brothers coming along and all that stuff. It's beautiful. You should check it out. So this is um, an extraordinary time where the world is in a crisis of AIDS and you as an individual sitting here, your butt in the seat can change the course of history. You can grab this emergency and take it into something else. My beautiful nephew had a graduation ceremony the other day and at the ripe old age of seven recited to me by heart the preamble of the Constitution. And I was struck with um, regard to it being relevant to this the part about domestic security uh, because AIDS is a crisis that is lapping at our shores. Stability in Africa is critical. There are 10 potential Afghanistans, you know, just kind of roiling under the surface there. And also, it's, it's an opportunity for us to have that grace and that elegance and that dignity of, of the ideas upon which our country was founded. We can um, be a merciful people. And that, to me, is what is the most moving. So. Thank you so much for hearing me out. It's my first time to talk about this a little bit, and I hope that I've been moderately clear. My husband will tell me in detail afterwards whether or not I was. He'll give me either an I or like, woof. Um, and it's my great, great pleasure to introduce to you um, the man, really, who needs no introduction. And he is going to educate you further and get you more inspired so we can, as I said, change the world. Bono. How can you be that gorgeous and be that smart? Uh, I always thought God wasn't fair. Anyway, that was actually Judd's debut as an AIDS activist who was here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Wow. Thank 
you, Art. Thank you, Chancellor Perlman. Uh, I'd like to thank my group for letting me off a little bit. Uh, they weren't sure that uh, if I was going solo, I'd sell any tickets. <laughs> I didn't tell them we were giving them away free. Um, anyway, uh, as she said, I was going to tell you why I'm here. And uh, that is a good question for a spoiled, rotten, overpaid, overnourished, occasionally under the table uh, rock star. I'm also underqualified to be standing on a podium in a university. I have no letters after my name, no PhD, no MA, little BS maybe, <laughs> sometimes. In fact, uh, not only are there not any letters after my name, I don't have a name after my name. <laughs> Funny, but uh, hey, it's rock and roll. <laughs> um, let me start off by saying what I'm what I'm not doing here, uh, because even though this is a lecture series, uh, I'm not here to lecture you, um, and even though this is a Sunday, I'm not here to preach. I'm here to listen. I'm here because it's World AIDS Day, <clears throat> and because in places like Africa, it's World AIDS Day every day. That's why I'm here, and that's why all these remarkable people are joining me. There's an emergency in Africa that we're hearing something about, but not really enough in the papers, on the television, or on the internet. It's a, uh, the emergency is AIDS, and it's already taken more lives than any war that's ever been fought. It's well on the way toward claiming more lives than all wars ever fought put together. Yeah, um, you're hearing statistics, um, you'll hear more. But behind the statistics, there are actual people. And, um, I've been to Africa many times. You probably read about my trip with Secretary O'Neill. Um, I was the guy in the funny hat. Uh, there, was a, there was a picture of us looking like Punch and Judy, which uh, is still hard to live down. But. Uh, Earlier in the year, I went to Malawi to a hospital in Lilongwe, which is the capital of Malawi. And I watched people queuing up to die, three in a bed. And I thought to myself, is this, is this, really, is this really happening? Am I, what am I seeing here? People queuing up to die, three in a bed. And, and and I came away with uh, more than a conviction that, uh, that I wanted to spend my life working to deal with some of these uh, people's uh, problems. I knew, I knew this was wrong. You know, many, you probably remember, I, I, I remember asking my grandfather about the Second World War, you know, and hearing about, you know, Jews being put on trains and sent to Auschwitz. And I remember asking him, how did you let that happen? And he said, well, you know, we didn't know really. And when we did know, we, we tried to do something about it. But it, it seemed unfathomable. Well, that's what we're doing again. We are watching people being put on the trains, so to speak. There are people dying because they don't have drugs that we take for granted here in the United States and in Europe where I live. And I don't think it's acceptable anywhere, anytime. And that's really what tonight is all about, because I'm absolutely sure that here in the capital of decency in America, which is the heart of America, I'm sure you agree. Am I right? Anyway, it's not just highly strong rock stars that are uh, getting worried about this. Even the CIA is warning that AIDS could fuel the collapse of entire governments, leaving a vacuum that can only be filled by, well, you know what. We saw what happens in Afghanistan. And uh, though the perpetrators of 9-11 were wealthy Saudis, they found sanctuary in the collapsed state that was Afghanistan. And as Ashley already mentioned, uh, and a senior White House uh, uh, official told me, we know there's another 10 um, potential Afghanistans in Africa. So this is serious. There's no war on earth is more destructive than the AIDS pandemic. 
That's not my, they're not my words. That's Colin Powell's words. And it's interesting when you get military men talking like that, because he also said that the war against terror is bound up in the war against poverty. Why would a military man say that? Maybe it's because he knows that the war against terror cannot be won by military means alone. We have to get to these places and, and we have to have a presence in these places um, and that is benign, that is uplifting. And I can tell you this, if you're saving somebody's mother, husband, child, brother, um, it's forget hearts and minds. Um, these are lives. If you're saving lives, then the kind of wacky, um, extremist, um, evil-minded ideas that are being spread about the West at the moment um, in Africa will be run out of town. And I'm looking forward to that day. Other reason why I'm here is, is, to be honest with you, there are people um, in Washington who have said to me that you don't care about this stuff. There's people who think there's no votes in these issues. There's people who think that uh, what they call so cynically flyover country, that you don't care. And I am here because I unshakably believe that you do. And <clears throat> so um, I, I'm a fan, as you know, uh, of this part of the world. I'm a fan of America. Um, America, the reason I'm a fan is that, you know, America is not just a country, it's an idea. I'm a fan of the idea of America. The idea of freedom and justice for all, all that stuff. These were the ideas that sent my great-grandfather's generation um, um, more than a century ago to find freedom and an opportunity. The idea that sent your grandfather's generation back across the Atlantic 60 years ago to save Europe from from tyranny and hatred. I believe in America. I believe that the people of America, I believe the people in this room can energize that idea and once again change the course of history. I really do. I also believe in Africa. I first went there uh, because of Live Aid. <clears throat> I don't know if you remember Live Aid. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I normally just, you have to apologize about a lot of things in the 80s. Uh, <laughs> um, the shoulder pads, the silk turd jackets with the radio station logos, and actually, I have a, uh, and the mullet. Uh, <laughs> so, men, men should never look like they iron their hair. <laughs> yes, I had a mullet, okay? And, well, there was a couple of good ideas came out of the 80s, and one of them was Live Aid. And uh, it was an extraordinary thing. Musicians stepped into a void left by politicians. And they said what was happening in Ethiopia, millions of people dying for lack of food and water was unacceptable. I was 26. Uh, I, went, I went to Africa for the first time. I was 26. I went with my young wife, younger wife, Ali. And... Uh, it's hard to describe the feeling of waking up in the morning, except in a tent, and looking out uh, as the mist lifted to see tens of thousands of people who'd been walking through the night to come and beg for food. I won't forget that. And worse than that, uh, I, 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 pe people, people stooping, uh, be made to stoop so low as to offer you their children because they felt they couldn't bring them up. A man, I remember a man, it was just the, the pride of his life, his son, 
in his arms and he carried him to me and gave before I had any children put this boy in my arms and said please will you take my son um, he won't live if he stays in my arms and I thought I, 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 I actually stopped thinking I think and just it was just one of those moments and anyway I, I swore I'd never forget but you do you get back to your life and so you should in one sense but I was determined to have a go at this, not just throwing pennies at the problem or not about charity. There's a certain aspect here. It's not about charity, it's about justice, actually. <clears throat> and equality. I mean, equality is a pain in the ass, really. I mean, you think about it, you can imagine these, these Jewish sheep herders arriving in front of pharaohs and and the pharaoh says to them and they're there with shit on their shoes you're equal to me and they look in their book and go yeah yeah that's what it says here we're equal all are created equal under god and then you know we finally you know start to accept that uh, we have to deal with the fact that um, African Americans here in America are equal and women are equal and the journey of equality goes forward. But we haven't really got to the spot where we think that Africans are equal, have we? Because if we really believed they were, we couldn't let what is happening to that continent happen. This is a matter of equality. <clears throat> Africa is a neighbor of the United States and Europe and you know something love thy neighbor wasn't just advice it was a command <clears throat> now some of the problems some of the problems uh, in Africa are you know not simple and, and it's not just about natural calamity either. Um, too many natural disasters are anything but natural. Corruption is a real problem in Africa. And despotism, there's no way around that. We can't fix every problem. But the ones we can, we must. We have the drugs, you know? These drugs are advertisements for what the United States can do for, the, for American innovation and technology. And, and I think we shouldn't be letting people die for the stupidest of reasons, money, or for that other excuse that I don't think Midwesterners will take because it's difficult. I don't think Midwesterners will take because it's difficult as an excuse. Am I right? <clears throat> And we're also starting to learn what works. You know, the de Drop the Debt campaign that uh, I was a part of with Jubilee 2000, it was amazing, actually. I, I stood in Uganda in a school with the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, and we saw schools that had been built by monies that were freed up by debt cancellation. Do you know, more than three times the amount of children are going to school well, just less, actually, than three times the amount of children are going to school in Uganda uh, now than were three years ago before the Drop the Dead campaign. So I'd like to big up the Drop the Dead campaign. <clears throat> so this is an example of what happens when people like you fill in the kind of action cards that are under your bums. Uh, please sign them right now. Leave them here. And then this week get five friends to do the same. If 10,000 people in Lincoln, Nebraska write the president and their congressman telling them to declare AIDS an emergency, they will pay attention, I promise you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there's one message, if there's one message I could get across to you tonight, is that you are more powerful than you think. 
I, um, I now want to introduce you to a very powerful person. I met her in Uganda, an AIDS activist, the firemen running up the building, burning building, if you like, the real hero of the hour. Uh, I'd like you to meet Agnes. part of Africa. Uganda has been, had, is a nice, beautiful country, but a poor country, and has been hit hard by the AIDS epidemic. And the government of Uganda, the president, was the first uh, uh, pre uh, president in Africa to announce about the problem of AIDS in his country. And I come from a, an organization called TASO, the AIDS support organization, which was the first support organization which started in Uganda way back in 1987. I worked there as a volunteer. Uh, I have been uh, an activist and I've joined activists in South Africa. We were in a meeting recently in Cape Town and the biggest problem we have is care and treatment to HIV positive people. I've been living with the virus for 12 years. I'm a mother of eight children now, and I'm 50 years old. Some people were, te were telling me that they thought when you reach the age of 50, you, you are above the infection. There I am. Uh, I want to share with you my story or my life experience with HIV AIDS in my family. It all started in 1991 when my husband fell sick with cryptococcal meningitis and he was tested HIV positive. Uh, he's, he was uh, trained here, he, he studied here in the University of Georgia, and he got a, a, a degree in a agriculture economics from 1984 uh, to 86. And he came back to Uganda, and he was really doing good job. And we, as his family, we are very happy with him, and we were very we. We are a very happy family. But in 1991, when he fell sick, we were all scared and worried. I and my 10 children had six boys and four girls. My husband was born alone uh, to his mother and father, and he wanted many children. so. We had had 10 children. So when he fell sick, he had, we had to buy a certain drug which is supposed to treat cryptococcal meningitis. And it was very, very expensive. We tried to buy it with all the savings we had, and we 
we, 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 we couldn't buy it anymore. And we, tass, we went to Tasso, but Tasso didn't have the drug. And we helplessly just watch him die, which was very, very painful. Because we knew in some places like Europe, the drugs were there, but we, we didn't have access to it. Then two months later, my son, Charles, who was 17, who had already asked me that after my daddy's death with AIDS, mommy, are you also going to die? Who will take care of us? It was a very difficult question. I said, I don't know. But I, I, I believe in God, and I said, we shall continue praying. But two months later, I think he thought so much about it that he got a mental breakdown, and he started uh, talking, and you know, like he wanted to go and meet the press, he wanted to go to the TV and radios to tell people that his parents were very good parents, they were very uh, careful parents, they were not careless. How come they got AIDS? And when I took to him to hospital, I thought maybe he had some kind of fever, or but he had they diagnosed he had a depression, and, and they kept treating him until he felt better. Then he went back to school. But when he reached school, because of the other students who had what he was talking about, they continued stigmatizing him throwing all hard words on him that he was not even going to succeed anywhere. He would not finish school. He will not get a job because his parents are all going to die of AIDS. And I think he felt very bad. And one night, uh, that was 19. 93 on the 5th of July, he disappeared from the school. And the news came to me that he had disappeared and I kept looking for him and I couldn't see him. And his father had died on uh, 92, 27th of June. So, and after he had died, I had also tested HIV positive. So I had uh, my status to, to deal with. I had lost my husband. We didn't have any resources. And my son there, he, he had disappeared. But I, kept, I tried always to look for him, put photographs in newspapers. I didn't get him. And up to today, I don't know whether he died. I don't know whether he's alive somewhere. I can't tell. And it's real, still very painful up to now. Uh, as if that was not enough, my youngest son, who, who by the time my husband died, he was three and a half years. And he didn't have any signs of AIDS. At the age of five, he started falling sick and getting problems with his breathing, chest problems. And I kept postponing. I didn't want to take him for an HIV test. I didn't want to learn that he was also positive. But eventually, I had to take him because I knew that if he had maybe a, a, a disease like TB, it could be treated. He tested HIV positive. I can't tell you how painful it is. I can't tell you the pain I went through 
nursing that small, young, innocent boy through all the pains of AIDS for a year and a half until he died at the age of six and a half on the 9th of March, 1995. It still pains me. I have that guilt of knowing that instead of giving the best to my son, I gave him HIV, which killed him. And I, I, I thought about it so much that I said I have to go out and do something. I went to Tasso and with a group of other activists who go out sensitizing people. And I'm all, I also have a group of women who receive services in Tasso where I'm the chairperson. And I went out talking openly about my status and telling people how to avoid getting HIV, how mothers can even give HIV to their children without their knowledge, even when they are in marriage. Some people think that people with AIDS are maybe the drug, uh, drug dealers or the mean the, the, the homos only or the what. Anybody can get AIDS. Anybody can get HIV. I think we should really change our attitudes. And if, even if somebody really got AIDS because maybe he was careless, but people can change. He may be, do a wrong thing today and he will change another day and be somebody else. So it's not good to have that bad attitude to people who are living with HIV or people who have died of AIDS. So we have been doing all we can to sensitize people. We have been trying as mothers, our parents, to prepare our children for the loss by writing memory books with them. And because we have found it a very big problem to, to reveal our zero status to our children, although we could talk about it out there, so, so that our children, uh, get, we get to, to plan with them they, were, they are future guardians. We plan with them, and uh, they, the, 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 the guardians also accept to maybe to, to take them when we are no more, or to plan with them about the, the projects we do so that they continue when we are not there. Uh, those who are in, able to go to school and they are supported to really put in all the effort to go to school because they, they know that tomorrow we may not be there. We've done all that and I think with the, the US government has been supporting TASO for over 10 years now. Although there is corruption in African countries, but I don't think if the US government had known that uh, TASO is corrupt, they would not continue supporting us up to today. But we are, what we have been supported is not enough. I think we still think we need antiretroviral drugs. I'm a living example of the people who are on antiretroviral drugs. Most of our people cannot afford them. They can't even afford the tests they do before or they continue doing when they are on these drugs. It is very sad to see people continue dying, our friends, our relatives, the people you live with every day, yet you know that 
somewhere in, in the European countries, the drugs are there. Some of them expire and they have to throw them away. And others have maybe to change combinations and say, I don't want that drug, I want to change on this. Where we are there yearn for these drugs. And I'm really very grateful to Data for having invited me here to share with you. Because I feel that America can do something. And America can take the lead to give us hope to live. Life is a gift from God which is very, very important. We all want to live. We feel that with these drugs we shall even uh, uh, reduce the infection. Because once people know that the drugs, the I mean the medicine, when I talk of drugs, I don't mean these drugs, the people inject them, the, the cocaine and so on. I mean the medicine. The medicines are very important to us. I've used them, and people think that Africans cannot take these drugs because they, they don't have watches, because we can take these drugs. I'm an example. People have been trying to sell their property in order to go and buy these drugs. And they, somewhere on the way, they can't afford and they have to stop. And they go back and look for somewhere, something else to sell. It has brought problems in their families. Who should take the drugs? The husband or the wife? The child who is HIV positive? Or the father? Everybody wants to live. Everybody needs the medicine. And I really think that something will be done. And I'm very happy to share with you my experience. And I, will, I, I think I will leave this America with the hope of knowing that something will happen. Thank you very much. for the dramatic and I don't think I've ever in my imagination from the Greek tragedies uh, my mother heard anything that um, dramatic and I visited with Agnes earlier today and, and was familiar with the outline of her life but the idea that there are families who have three people infected and drugs for one and how you make that choice as to whom you're going to give it. There are cards under your seats and they're action cards and they're awesome. Would love for you to take them out right now and fill them out with your name and address. You can send one to the president, one to your local congressperson and if you don't know those addresses by heart there are people in the lobby who can help you with that. That is how you can tolerate Agnes's story. That is how you can abide the fact that this devastation and sadness is happening as I speak to you right now. You can convert that information to action, to change, to progress, and to hope. Would also be wonderful if, as Bono said, you took 
three, five, however many you can really use and give those action cards to your friends, your family, and talk about this. Talk about it at home. Talk about what's happening in Africa and talk about the fact that it's happening here too. You know, sex education is really important. Um, the next person to whom I'm gonna introduce you is, uh, has, has walked with the saga of HIV since its inception. He was at the ground zero, if you will, in San Francisco in um, 81, working at the San Francisco General, and he was the medical director there when AIDS was first you know, discovered and in its most unfortunate way, catching on. And then in 91, he went to Washington where he was helping with the Ryan White um, Care Act, which is an interesting progression because that's when AIDS was making that transition from you know, this, this stigma in society is a gay man's disease, and then when Ryan was infected and died, here was this, you know, beautiful, perfect little white boy, you know, who through no habit or malice of his own uh, was infected. So from there, Dr. Goosby has done all sorts of amazing things with the American government is now back at San F University of California at San Francisco, where they have founded the Pangea Global AIDS Foundation, and he is going to give you the good news. Um, but again, make sure that you fill out those action cards and make sure that you don't forget Agnes's story. Dr. Goosby, please. Well, thank you very much. It's really an honor to have an opportunity to talk to you tonight. I think Agnes really represented a story that we can hear repeated many times in our own country, the United States, but also hundreds of thousands of times in Sub-Saharan Africa. Out of the 42 million living with HIV in the world, 29.4 million are in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's an extraordinary number. That's 60% of the world's epidemic is occurring in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's clear that prevention is an important intervention in curtailing this epidemic. But it's also clear that prevention is best realized and most effective when it is partnered with treatment. Partnering with treatment allows the prevention to be delivered to those individuals who are already HIV positive and the conduit through which the virus will move to the uninfected. But it also, by its action, continuously addresses the issue of stigma to not forget the already infected, to not step over the 29 million, but to engage them in care and services is definitely the right message and is the best thing that moves stigma. The last thing that treatment does is it imparts hope. It directly addresses the idea that it's not time to give up, that I can fight, and prevent and delay, that I can change my slope of decline from a rapid exit to one that is slower, or maybe even not gonna happen. Physicians know the importance of hope in treating anything. If you don't have it, you've lost your best weapon. And we find ways to bring it back into the dialogue, even in those moments when it is quite hopeless. But HIV is not that. HIV, in the context of treatment, has an opportunity to take individuals and move them into a slower progression, as people were saying earlier, into a chronic disease. The United States government has attempted to address issues of HIV on a global scale. USAID, one of its agencies under the State Department, Health and Human Services and CDC, Center for Disease Control, Health Resource Service Administration, HRSA, 
it's the, or, it's the uh, site of the Ryan White program, and the National Institutes of Health, have converged for really about 11 years in activities that have predominantly been focused on prevention and in the last year have moved into developing programs and supporting programs that focus on treatment. The NIH has focused its attention and its, mo and its dollars on doing research in all those areas, prevention as well as treatment, vaccine development, development of antiretrovirals, immunopotentiators, treatments of opportunistic infections. I think that the irony and tragedy is that these medical advances have not been uniformly available to everyone on the planet. And it behooves us to look at the reasons that are blocking access, to understand them and to eliminate them, and also to address issues of resources. It is by chance that an individual is born in the United States, in the Europe, the United Kingdom, in Western Europe, Australia, Canada, areas that have made a commitment to their populations to deliver antiretrovirals, to treat opportunistic infections, to treat sexually transmitted diseases for everybody, regardless of their income status. Treatment requires, without a doubt, medical infrastructure. You need a place to treat. You create a place to treat. You have hospitals, you have clinics. In Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa, you have all of this. In many places, you have already developed TB treatment centers. Things that can easily be molded and moved into expanding their medical service capability to address the needs of HIV-infected individuals with treatment for opportunistic infections, to prevent opportunistic infections prophylaxis, to treat sexually transmitted diseases, and to introduce antiretrovirals to the sickest. This partnering and mentoring, the University of Nebraska, clearly with the Chancellor's comments, has already started. Dr. Woods's work, an impressive example of partnering with institutions in Zimbabwe that allow for a treatment capability that was not there to be there. And as your colleagues get more comfortable in treating HIV, they become a resource for their colleagues and country, and you create a durable capability. It's cheap, it's effective, and I actually think, as opposed to the paratrooping idea of resources and talent into an area for a limited period of time, is the durable intervention. But the costs are real. The costs are extraordinary. In the United States, it's $12,000 for antiretrovirals. In Rwanda, it's $100 a month. Uganda, similar amount. Prices have gone down and can get, if you use generics, down to $350 a year. But in a continent where the average per capita income is about 200 US dollars a year. This is an un unattainable amount of money. In a continent where the average departments of health spend $2 per capita for all of their citizens, for all health needs, this is an insurmountable amount of money. But we started this with the songs of the children who created a feeling of life and engagement but mostly of hope. Creating these delivery systems that we can put our knowledge, knowledgeable providers in, knowledgeable providers who can treat patients with HIV, who are of the country and are going to stay in the country, those durable contributions last long after it leaves our, it leaves our mind and leaves our pocketbooks. But it is about hope, and I do appreciate the um, difficulty in imparting hope to a situation, but there, if I can leave you with nothing else, may I leave you with this, that the infrastructure is there to put these dollars into, that transparency, systems of transparency are well known to us to allow us to know where the dollars go, and that it's time to engage, it's time to commit, 
for the commonality of the human spirit and the human condition, we need to unite around this issue. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goosby. And he's not even asking for your money. He's not asking for you to give money tonight. Isn't that refreshing? He's asking you, as we all are, to send those action cards to Washington so we can convince President Bush to declare the AIDS emergency so that money that is already going to Africa can be designated to help sick people. It's very cool. And he mentioned the antiretroviral drugs, which we discussed earlier, and I learned an amazing thing. Um, a person who is bedridden and very close to death once administered this antiretroviral drug within three weeks will be gaining weight sitting up excuse me it was sitting up and eating and then shortly thereafter gaining weight and within three months back to work so there is hope and with all this applause I think you guys are actually doing a great job too you have an amazing attention span and uh, now I will introduce our last speaker before we do questions and answers. Um, my husband's hero, four-time winner of the Tour de France, Lance Armstrong. You guys are nice. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I've never been to Lincoln. Um, and uh, I'm surprised. This is a nice place. I'm, I'm, a, long, I'm a Longhorn, so... It's not easy for a Texas Longhorn to come up here and say that. So. Uh, listen, um... Some of you might be wondering why I'm here. Uh, I'm a bike racer, I'm a father, I'm a cancer survivor, um, but, well. <laughs> but as the doctor just said, um, or touched on, I was somebody that uh, five, six years ago, excuse me, um, was put in a bad situation and given roughly a 50-50 chance of living um, but I had hope. I had hope that uh, that I would live. I had hope that I would find the best doctors in the world. I had hope that I would get the best drugs in the world, the best surgeries in the world, and I believed that. And uh, I get a call uh, the other night from Bono, which is always interesting. <laughs> um, I was in an interview. I got to say, excuse, hang on a sec, Bono's calling. Um, <clears throat> That's a true story. And uh, Bono and I started to talk, and, and he started telling me the story about what he's doing and what he's doing here in the heartland. And I think that as, as athletes or as musicians or as actresses or whatever, I, I think sometimes we feel a push or an obligation to be connected to something because if you don't, you might be viewed as greedy or you might be viewed as selfish. <clears throat> and I didn't know what the situation was with, with Bono and this cause. And, as I started to listen, I realized that, that this man is, is possessed. And in a, in a, and I mean that in, 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 in the greatest way. And uh, the way he was talking about this tour and about the problem and about Africa, uh, I realized he was very serious. And I, I continued to listen. And, and actually, all I was doing was listening because it was a long conversation. And I didn't say anything. Uh, but finally he said to me, he said, he said, Lance, he says, you don't understand. He's talking about situations. He talked about Agnes. He talked about her story. And he said, these people don't have any hope. And I immediately said, wait a minute. Something's wrong with that. And so that is why I'm here. Because as a 31-year-old kid from Texas that, that thought he had all the best stuff and all the best possibilities in the world, to hear that somebody uh, with a different situation, but very similar situation, 
halfway around the world doesn't have any hope, that's not right. And uh, after that really hit me, I said, okay, I have to be there. I, I don't know really what I can say. Uh, I think finally the, the ultimate reason, uh, and Bono said it to me, he says, look, just come and listen and learn. And so I'm like you guys. I'm here to listen, to learn, to try to affect other people's lives around the world and try to give them uh, this little thing called hope. And so do what you can, do what you feel motivated to do and inspired to do, but I think we all thank you for being here and we all, we all hope that, uh, that you don't just look at your neighbor and you don't just look uh, to, to California or to New York or whatever, but, but realize that there is a, a big world here and there's big problems and, and everything you, you, you can do or, or try to do is, is ultimately very beneficial. So thank you for having me and uh, let's keep up this fight. Bono's keeping a little diary for AOL about this experience, and, and I think I'm going to start my own, which is a diary of the legend of Bono's phone calls, <laughs> because they are legion. So we're going to do some questions and answers, and our first question is, Terry, you'll have to excuse me if I don't pronounce your last name right, D-I-M-O-N, Diamond, you right there. Stop for a little smooch. Ladies and gentlemen, Phil Donahue. <laughs> right, and, and, and everyone, if you, who, everyone who has a question, please write down that question, and uh, you will raise your hand. Someone will come around to collect it, and then we'll sort through them. I think we've got about 20 minutes to spend on this. Again, your attention span is extraordinary. And you can direct your questions not only to Bono, but to anyone on the stage. Just don't ask the chancellor any questions about, you know, the football team or whatever. You save that for later. <laughs> so where's Terry? Hi, Terry. Where are you from? I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska, here in, in town. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I guess um, I'm a public school teacher. I work with middle school children, and all the references to the children and the orphans and things, and... Bono said that a little less than three times as many kids are going back to school. I'm just thinking in a, in a country, in a continent that's, you know, in this kind of havoc, as far as the educational system goes, is there a crisis of manpower in trying to take care of those kids educationally that are left? Terry's thinking about joining the Peace Corps. <laughs> we have any Peace Corps people here? Sign her up! <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, yeah, the educational system um, is non-existent in, in some villages in Africa because entire generations have gone missing. You have the grandparents and you have the children and uh, their mothers and fathers are gone. Teachers are dying faster than they can be trained. And um, so there is a manpower shortage, absolutely. And and what's great about schools is that they work great in the area of prevention. You know, teaching um, young women um, um, to say no um, uh, when they're not ready for sex, believe it or not, is an issue. And uh, so when you don't have schools, you lose a, uh, you lose a, a, a chance to engage with the community um, in prevention. And, and of course, uh, hope, uh, the thing that uh, Lance talks about, I mean, there's no greater hope than giving somebody an education. Any other questions? Something else that um, Dr. Goosby and I talked about earlier today was that um, it's so important for kids to continue to be educated because while obviously you want to respect the indigenous culture, we need to help educate young women that it's okay not to breastfeed if you're infected because they can be ostracized by the older women in their communities and a lot of pressure can be put on a young mother to breastfeed even if she's sick because her own mother insists that that's the way it should be done. And that's very, very sad. Okay, our next question is from, oh, Dr. Swindles, where are you? 
Oh boy, my exercise. Okay. <laughs> if I touch you, I think I'll give you static electricity. I just scooted across the carpet. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Sue Swindles. I'm an AIDS doctor here in uh, Nebraska at the university, and I have a question for Agnes. Um, we, when you hear talk about AIDS in Africa, we hear a lot about prevention, and it's almost as if that's good enough for people in Africa, and it is cost effective and it is important, but I'd like you to say something about how you feel about that and how you feel about wh why it's important to have treatment available too. You know, why should someone go get an HIV test if all they get is stigma <laughs> and ostracism and misery? Uh, why it's important to have the treatment available and what you think we can do to make that happen. Thank you. Yeah, it is very important to have treatment available because some people wouldn't want even to go for an HIV test although they are not sure of their health. Because after all, even if they go for an HIV test, there is no treatment and they can't afford treatment. And even with uh, the, the medicine for prevention or reducing the infection from mother to child, it, okay, it's there, it's free now, but if the mother is not treated, and yet this mother is going to breastfeed this baby, this baby will still get infected. And if she, she decides not to breastfeed, she doesn't have the money to buy the formula to feed on this baby. And in just in case she had all this, this woman, after giving birth to this baby, her immune system goes down and she gets a lot of other infections and this woman will die. And maybe the father of the child will also die this child will have nobody to take care of, of to, to look after this child. Obviously, this child will not go to school. And I think with uh, prevention and treatment go together. Once there is treatment, people, a lot of people will go for the test because they know there is treatment. And if, for example, a mother is on treatment and she continues to breastfeed, at least when she's on treatment, there are chan chances of getting infection from the breast milk are small. And I, I even think that about uh, this lady was talking about children who, go, who don't go to school. Because if all the parents have died, this ch these children don't go to school. And the, the, especially the girls, when they don't go to school, what else? They are, they are vulnerable, they are poor, they are used by men, other people who have bits of money to give them here and there or to take them for mar early marriages, and they end up with HIV. All these, I think, with treatment, are going to be reduced. Even the, the fact that there are a lot of orphans left behind. When you are on treatment, you can go on and work, and you can keep your children, and at least you can do the best you can for your children. So if, and if you are a single parent like me, you can still go on and at least the children will continue. There will be direction, there will be uh, education, even just education about home, how to prevent themselves from HIV, how to avoid sex abuse, a lot of things we have been doing, but we feel treatment is lacking.
about your action cards, which I know all of you have filled out by now, um, if you really want to get involved with this cause and work closely with these issues, you can put a little star on your card and you will be contacted and you can um, you know, get more, more, more deeply involved in helping. Also, your cards will be picked up here by ushers, so you leave them with us and we'll take care of the mailing. And can I, I just thank the, the good doctor for her question yeah. and for the extraordinary work that she's doing here and the thing that we discovered today, you know, I went to church today in Nashville to preach it, and it turns out they were preaching to me. Then there's incredible work going on in the community already, and I'd just like to thank Dr. Pedan. You're Terry? Tracy. Tracy, excuse me, where are you from? Thank you for being here. No, thank you. Thank you all, especially Agnes, thank you. What my question was, it's kind of just been answered, was how do we here in Nebraska, how do I as an individual, my friends, we were talking about this before, how do we become involved? How do we actually do something? We fill out the cards, but what do we do here in Nebraska? That's what we want to know. These cards are very, very powerful things, actually. Um, and and I, I, Oh, we get a demerit. It's a first night flaw. Oh. Where are the cards? They should rain down from heaven. Well, we, we better, uh, uh, we're very sorry about this. Uh, Wait, Lance, Lance is the, is the athlete. We'd like to this apologize for the transmission now. breakdown. But, but when you get the cards, you will find they are very, very powerful. Um, you know, G Gordon Brown is the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the United Kingdom, um, the, the Secretary of the Treasury, if you like. He got, I think, 300,000 cards on, um, on, 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 on the Drop the Debt campaign, and it really made a difference. Now, he didn't see all those cards, uh, but he heard the number. Uh, he was shown one, actually. Um, there was one his staff figured he really better see, and it was from his mother. And so <laughs> those cards, they really count. Uh, someone can get one to Barbara Bush. Uh, I think that would be great. Um, and and, and mo cause mothers, mothers really, really matter here. Um, again, I'm reminded of a politician who heard uh, horns blowing out his window and, and thought, oh, it's the, it was the student activists again, looked out, it was the mother's union. Uh, uh, a whole collection of mothers' unions blowing their horns, and then he got really nervous. So I think I think I think sending the cards are important, and um, organizing meetings are important. I promise you this: this is this is a historic moment, um, uh, and 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 history will judge us by how we deal with this moment. This 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 is. This may not be on the news yet and on the front pages yet the way it should be, but it will be. And I, I am sure that our generation, our time will be remembered for three things probably. The internet, the war against terror, and what we did or didn't do concerning the AIDS emergency. And uh, so this, this is worth calling a meeting over and uh, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure of that. Where's little nine-year-old Kennedy? Kennedy asked a great question, which was, congru which was congruent with Tracy's, which is, you know, how does someone here help? And in particular, how does a nine-year-old help? And I think that... Um, Where is she? she? She's up there, and she's adorable. I Bring can tell her down from here. here. <laughs> Your even being here is a start, because I think the key to all of this is consciousness and not being in denial and accepting the fact that there are problems at home and elsewhere and that we can respond to them with compassion and grace and mercy. And you should probably check out the data website because you're probably just a phenomenon on it, on the internet, right? <laughs> so www.data, is data, it data, data twice? Dot org. Yeah, dot org. And you can look at that, you can learn, and it will give you a lot of suggestions as to how you can help. You can also talk about it with your family and talk about it with your friends. And I think that Washington really listens to young people because you'll be old enough to register to vote really soon.
Thank you for being here, Kennedy. Um, this is a question that Agnes, um, the you referred to it a little bit in what you said, and it is from Ezra Zietler. Where are you? Hi, Ezra. Great name. Did you hate it when you were little? <laughs> Ezra was wanting to know about the social ramifications uh, to an individual in Africa if they publicly admit that they are HIV positive. Maybe the doctor would answer that. I think that uh, for anybody who's HIV positive to reveal your seropositivity to your family and to those around you is always a hurdle. Um, the irony of it is, is that usually what you find is a willingness to engage and help uh, deal with the specifics of your illness. In Africa, and it varies from region to region, um, the stigma is severe. It uh, is uh, shameful to be HIV positive and you bring shame upon your, if you're a woman, your husband, who usually is the conduit through which you obtain the infection and is infected. Um, but he will reject you frequently. There's the threat of that. His family will reject you. And often um, the community in which you reside um, may reject you as well. Now, this is variable, it's, it's evolved over time. There are many communities now where you will actually be embraced in, uh, in care and services because of work like the Tasso organization in Kampala in Uganda, where the awareness in the community has risen to a point where people realize that uh, needs unmet need to be addressed, and that's really what it's about and not about the judgment aspect of it. Yeah, the, the stigma is still there. It has not cleared. Like I told you, my son might have, must have disappeared because he was stigmatized so much in his school, especially with the, the schools. And my children have been being, they were they have been getting stigmatized in schools. Even my daughter at the university, uh, Makerere, at one time, I, I was, when Paul, the, the Secretary of, of Treasury came to Uganda and I appeared on CNN, uh, they were writing like cards. As you know, in a university, they wrote several cards and they were writing sympathy card, like a sympathy card, and then I would put there that your mother has got a way of making money. They thought, I mean, they, they were just stigmatizing her. And my daughter had to leave university and come home for about three days, and I had to do a, do a lot of counseling on her. And other people are, are, are really not failing to come out. But we say, and I've been telling my children, just because of other people, we have to fight it. This stigma, we just have to fight it. Because at first it was very, very high. But now it's, at least it's not as bad. And my other daughter who has just gone to the university this, the, this year, didn't even want to hear me on the radio. The moment she would hear me talk on the radio she, at school, she would just switch it off. But I'm surprised today she gave me a call that she went to re on radio to talk about stigma, how people should not stigmatize other people who are affected uh, because their parents are having AIDS, are living with AIDS, and so on. So it's all about fighting it. It's the fight we talk about. Back home, we don't have uh, the money to fight it as much, but we fight it by becoming open. We fight it by continuing talking. 
we go to public places and we want to tell people that you know people who are looking healthy who don't look who, who are not slim are the ones who don't have HIV which sometimes was uh, a, another problem which was making people get more and more infected people had queer beliefs like uh, raping young ki children because they thought that somebody who is infected with HIV will get a cure by uh, raping an, a virgin. So, so many queer uh, uh, beliefs people have and we have to continue talking, we have to continue going public and trying to fight it. It's there but the more we fight it, the more we reduce. And I th I'm telling you, if we get antiretroviral drugs, even those who are stigmatizing others, once they, they, they will want to go for a test. And once they test, if they find themselves positive, they will regret why they were stigmatizing others. Amen. I love that this next card isn't signed because it's somebody with a nose for controversy. What are the pharmaceutical companies doing to help or hinder the aid to Africa? I've heard that the prices are inflated. Is this a conspiracy theory or is it the truth? Stand up, we love you, don't be shy. This is a great question. Ah, oh, sucker. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to answer that. Uh, can I just say that this is a moment in time where this crisis is so bad that actually we can't afford to play good guys and bad guys. We're actually beyond that. This is, the, the truth is the pharmaceutical companies, um, uh, we need their research and development. Um, we need the drug prices to drop, they will drop. Um, I think, I think it is worth encouraging them um, to drop their prices. Um, we, for instance, have discovered that only one drug company is working on an AIDS vaccine, Merck, as it happens. This is a real worry. When we ask why, we find out, well, you know, if we do come up with any AIDS stuff, um, all your activist friends <laughs> Uh, start throwing rocks at us and so we've got to be careful about this we actually need the pharmaceutical companies it is not acceptable that these drugs are at this price and they will come down and they will come down because we'll camp outside um, um, their their offices but I don't think we should demonize the industry actually because because we need them and uh, I was one of those people throwing the rocks, by the way. And right now, um, I want to make friends with these people because my friends here really need them. So that's, you know, I'm ready to put my, swallow my pride on that one. It's a little bit of the lion lying down with the lamb. Uh, this is going to be our last question, but I think that we can... Um, in closing, address a lot of the other things that are addressed in these additional cards. Um, Adam Taylor. Gone to the bathroom, missing his moment. Oh, is that you? Okay, hi, Adam. Adam um, asks a great question, which is a wonderful way for us to sort of um, close things up because it's so relevant to what data is um, striving to achieve. It says African countries are paying more to service debts than on their health and education systems combined? What can be done to push for full debt cancellation? Let's all say that together. Full yeah. debt cancellation. That is, a, that, is, that is a very, very good question. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, you can't fix every problem. But the ones you can, you must. Um, this is madness, you know, the, the idea of, 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 of diverting funds that should be going on health and education to paying off old loans. Loans that a lot of them 
it wasn't just irresponsible borrowing, it was irresponsible lending. We often lent um, these African countries and crazy cracked dictators money for geopolitical reasons. Um, and it has to be said. And, uh, and yes, uh, people like Mabuzu went off and with the money and put it in their Swiss bank accounts. We can't hold um, the children uh, of what was then Zaire to ransom for our stupidity and his dishonesty. I think that is absolutely clear. <coughs> So I think, I mean, that's, uh, these are all great questions. And can I just end this by, by saying, uh, I don't know, actually, Judd, what's going on here? She's <laughs> turned into Phil Donahue as an AIDS <laughs> activist, done an incredible job. And we're very lucky to have her on the road. There was a really good question which addresses um, the corruption that seems to be so rampant within many countries in Africa. And the good doctor said that there was transparency and that's something that you can learn more about on the website so that you know that the money that the American government has designated for um, Africa is being used for the right sorts of things and not just, uh, you know, some guy's Ferraris and watches that he hasn't properly earned. And um, is education the solution? Education, 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 education. Education is always the answer. And then I think that this is a great one because as a healthcare provider, it must be so devastating to be around this and feel like your hands are tied behind your back. As a healthcare provider, what can I and my colleagues do to best benefit data's cause? It's a really good question. Um, you want me to answer it? <laughs> I, I, I think uh, I'll let the doctor answer that one. Just. Uh, I think that the, um, the opportunity to create um, meaningful partnerships that put your expertise, skill, and even some of your resources in connection, in a communication, ongoing connection with a healthcare delivery system uh, that's in the middle of this epidemic uh, is something that would be a wonderful contribution. Um, and I would be very happy to help you do that. The other would be to volunteer time uh, where you would go and work with nurse providers and doctors in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there's two sites, one in Uganda and Kampala at the University of Makerere, uh, and the other uh, is in South Africa at the University of Cape Town, where we try to pool uh, regional expertise for six-week stents to uh, treat very concrete, specific things. So uh, depending on what your area of expertise is, we could probably hook you up. You Can I also ask uh, a any, I'm sure there's local people. We're getting a lot of questions about what can I do. There's a lot of things going on at a local level. Um, I would ask, like to ask any of these local leaders um, to just please stand up so that we can see who they are and that you, you can see who they are and, and, uh, and ask them how you can help them later. So people who are involved um, locally, perhaps you would, you would stand up. There's some great um, organizations here. What's your organization? This is Save Sub-Saharan Orphans Incorporated. So get in touch with them. I'm wearing the t-shirt. I think we should thank the doctor uh, here. Just having his brain on hand has been really, really helpful. I would like to thank Lance Armstrong, who I had phone sex with. Um, <laughs> I would like to thank our esteemed friends for the loan of their university. We're going to trash it later. And most of all, 
I would like to thank Agnes for coming to Uganda. This is America. Thanks, Ashley. It's the Donnie and Marie of activism. Well, we all want to thank you because we wouldn't be here if your heart wasn't into this. And there was a card from some people from Bosnia and Herzegovina who also wanted to thank you. So that's just representative of how far a rock star can reach. I have been to your country and, had <laughs> and drank many drinks there. <laughs> you guys are awesome. So thank you for coming tonight and get involved. All right, here comes the Gateway Ambassadors. Give it up. Gateway Ambassadors. our world, the way we live, learn, survive, fight hunger and health problems. No, you can see our world through all the pain and suffering. You can see us as we are. Would you like to live in our world? The beautiful possibilities. The best future Africa has to offer the world are its beautiful children. Look, what do you see? Do you see what I see? Great opera stars. La 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 Ave Maria Quasia plena Dominus Deco Future Broadway stars Old Man River That Old Man River It just keeps rolling along Things are happening every day. Hey, what's little dancer? to bring peace and unity again. And I'll be a great philanthropist to find the resources. And now, can't you see how great we are? Because I'm going to be the female doctor to find the cure for AIDS. United against AIDS. United and be safe. Get the difference and get to know what AIDS is all about. United against AIDS. United and be safe. So many times I'm worried, and other times I'm crying. So let's get together and fight until we reach the end. So many times I'm worried, and other times I'm crying. So let's get together and fight until we reach the end. United against it. United and be safe. I want to thank all those who have given 
on December 8th. You can get together with like-minded individuals who want to help change the world. December 8th, 3 p.m., United Methodist Church, North 45th Street. North 45th Street, United Methodist Church, Church, December 8th. Be there or be square. Nebraska! To, um, like to do something that's not really on the menu. Um, um, well, the the day job. Uh, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Larry Edge and Adam. Say hello to Peter. This is a song we're working on with Dave Stewart. Uh, it's called American Prayer.
in your family. 